Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, this is O-Culture, where we do some die metal tripping on the realities constructed deep within the bowels of our subconscious. I am Ryan Peverly, your ceremonial master, the insane entity you've encountered while investigating those occult realities in your membrane. Welcome to the show. Thank you for taking the time to hang out in this neck of the woods. It's a good time to venture on through, too, because we've got a true modern-day psychonaut in the house. His pseudonym is Dick Khan, and he's the author of the book DMT and My Occult Mind, Investigation of Occult Realities Using the Spirit Molecule. This book is actually the first of a three-book series that chronicles more than 600 DMT experiments that Dick conducted over the course of three years. His experiments landed him a speaking gig at the recent Breaking Convention 2017, the fourth international conference on psychedelic consciousness. And after his talk there, his story was then featured on Vice.com. He's a man who smoked DMT more times in a day than I have in a lifetime, and a man who's got entities on speed dial. But let's do some dialing of our own and ratchet this thing up to 528 hertz and cast this pot off into the occulted land of Pineal where we find the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Enjoy. Hey, Dick, how are you? I'm good, thank you, Ryan. Thank you for giving me this opportunity, Ryan. That is much appreciated. I'm really excited for you to be here as well because I haven't... Well, I know you're using a pseudonym to write under, so that's fine, but I haven't seen your name around in this circle until um, a friend of mine had just stumbled across you on Twitter and said, hey, you should probably check this guy out. And you only had like maybe maybe 10 or 15 followers on there. And I thought, wow, like this guy and and what you were writing about was super interesting. And as soon as I I found out what your story was, I was like, I have to talk to you. And then the the article with Vice came out and I thought, well, that should blow you up a little bit. But I don't know how the uh, the press has been for you since that Vice story came out. How has it been? It's been really good. I mean, to be honest, I'm I'm reasonably new to social media. I only took to social media in February of this year when I published my book and, you know, a few few close friends said, you know, you really need to be on social media if you want to get your book out there. So Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, th- these are new things to me. They're sadly necessary to promote anything these days, but it is a useful tool when you're promoting, I think, the sorts of information that we're going to be getting into here. So just on the social media point, I've got to say, I, I, I've fallen in love with it which is probably what most people who take to it do it's it's super interesting and meet some incredible people from all around the world you know people with very different stories to mine and you know I mean yeah I can see why it's called social media the the social aspect is phenomenal yeah it definitely is you know like I said I've I've connected with a lot of people around the world as well just through the podcast here and it's been great I'm meeting people not just from you know, different states here in the U.S., but also, you know, I've met people from Europe and Australia and Scandinavia and Asia, and it's it's, it's a fascinating sort of, uh, I guess I would call it a social experiment to use the same sort of language that we're talking around. Yes, indeed. So you wrote this book, DMT and My Occult Mind, Investigation of Occult Realities Using the Spirit Molecule. Before we get into the book, though, and your experiments, I'd like for you to tell us a bit about yourself and, you know, how you came to be the author of this book. Where did your interest in the DMT first, where did that begin? My interest in DMT came from me just chancing upon the Spirit Molecule documentary by Rick Strassman and Mitch Schultz and I watched that and I got to be honest, I was I was goosebump city. I was blown away by it. You know, especially when those volunteers, research volunteers, started explaining their experiences. I was like, wow, this is really serious. And I I just got to check that out. So that was my introduction to DMT in terms of, you know, kind of what it is without actually having tried it. So the fact that you went went into this open minded enough to want to try it is interesting to me. How old were you and, and what was your life like? You know, as much detail as you want to give, where were you at in your life in terms of being able to actually undertake these several hundred experiments with DMT? I, I don't mind sharing. I'm, I'm a 46-year-old male now. 
I'm married. I've got two young boys, two great boys, uh, age nine and 11. I've got a, a fantastic wife who's infinitely understanding and has given me, you know, I, I guess no headaches about me pursuing this. And, um, yeah, I, I, I've got a regular job. I got, you know, a good job. I like my job. And I saw that spirit molecule. I, I researched for months and months about, you know, what people are experiencing on there. And yeah, you know, eventually got, got to try it. But okay, my, my, my social situation is, yeah, just, 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 just a regular family guy. And, um, you know, took to the DMT and very, well, from the outset became, I think infatuated is probably the right word. I wouldn't want to say obsessed, but yeah, infatuated by its its apparent magical capacity. And yeah, that that's that's how I got into it. And that that's kind of an outline of my me, my social situation. You know, happily married, regular guy, regular job. I haven't heard the term paramagical. I might steal that if that's all right. That's pretty cool. <laughs> You can take that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think I was saying, um, I tell you what, yeah, I think you just coined one there because I was saying uh, apparently magical, but yeah, I like the oh, phrase that you coined. Oh, oh, shit, coined okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's kudos to you, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, we just made something up then. So that does, you know, talking about something being magical, that does sort of lead us into the term occult. And, you know, that's a huge part of this book as well is, is this occult and esoteric thinking and philosophy and mindset where did your interest in that sort of philosophy or way of thinking, where did that begin for you? Yeah, I mean, okay, and, and, and I mean, when I answered that, i got to say that that probably, that is a large preface of, of the book before I get into the DMT and the DMT experiments, in that as a, as a young child, I had some, you know, unusual experiences. I, I had classic OBEs, classic out-of-body experiences. And they came about from a, a very specific thing in that, you know, awake in bed at night as a young child, I was fascinated by that transition from being awake to somehow being asleep. It really fascinated me. And I, I would lay awake at night trying to catch that moment where wakefulness became sleep. And it, honestly, I, I invested so much will into that as a young child. And, and then, uh, uh, you know, um, occasionally as a result of that, wow, my, I had out of body experiences, classic OBEs where I'm aloft, you know, in the midst of the room. My young body is, is below me on the bed. And just by dint of will, I can move around the family house and I can just go right through the wooden doors and everything in the house is just as it would be where I awake, you know, my brother's in bed, my parents are in bed. And, you know, I mean, a couple of other things. I mean, you know, one of some real significance in that, you know, I, I woke up one morning and it was a bright morning and I'm laid in bed and I, I had it in my head. I thought it's, it's Christmas, Christmas day, it's Christmas morning. You know, I'm still a very young child. And I figured, you know, there's going to be lots of presents downstairs. It's, it's going to be great. And I got out of bed and I pulled open my curtains. And my God, you know, beyond the foot of the garden, just above the, the lines of the telegraph poles, there was like a sun. You know, it wasn't the sun, but it was like a sun. It was glowing. It was unbelievable. And I was just transfixed by it. And I, I was like watching, 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 and I thought, okay, I, I need to bring my mum to see this. And clear forgot that I'm thinking it's Christmas morning. I ran downstairs, mum, come and see this. And mum came upstairs, and it had gone. And then I realised it's not Christmas, it's just summer. And, I mean, that, honestly, that was a really profound e experience, you know. It was, um, yeah, I, th I think experiences like that, sort of instilled in me a genuine interest, desire, passion for esoteric and, and occult thinking, you know, that the, the, there's, there's something unseen, I can sense it, I don't know what it is, but there's something there. The, the, the phrase I formulated in my mind, and I remember exactly when I formulated it, was there's something that somebody is not telling me, and I just knew it, I was convinced of it. 
and then skip forward 20, 30, however many years and the DMT experiments. And I thought, that's it. I knew there was something that somebody's not telling me. And that is it right there. Yeah, I've had uh, some interesting experiences, too, with at that point where you're kind of hovering between, you know, wakefulness and, and being asleep. So I know exactly what you're talking about there. I've never left my body like you have. And I'm wondering, were your OBEs, like, were they induced in any sort of way that you can recall or were they spontaneous? Well, w- w- what is interesting and what I should have added is that, you know, when you, you take DMT, you get that, that ringing sound in the center of your head. Well, that sound, I have I have had that sound in my head naturally for as long as I can remember. In fact, again, as a young boy, laid awake in bed at night that sound would just sound so prominent and that too was a real central part of my childhood you know from an esoteric aspect because I I would think well why are my parents not talking about this surely they have that sound in their head you know why does nobody ever mention it and it, it, it was in bed where I was sort of trying to fight sleep I guess and that sound just, its prominence just became incredible. So, you know, if it was induced, it was self-induced. What esoteric mechanics were going on in my head, I, I just do not know. But what I really would have loved is, is to have some control over that. You know, I mean, there were, there were times when I, I tried to fight sleep and would just fall asleep. But yeah, five or six times where, as I say, I had a classic OBEs and... I guess it was induced just from from you know the natural esoteric capacity or, or, or I don't know neurochemicals whatever in my head. Okay, so I'm glad you brought up the sound that you were experiencing in your head because I often get a sort of ringing sound in my head and I I don't know where it comes from. I'm very much into, I don't know if you're familiar with things like cymatics or like frequency and vibrations and things like that. You know, like you might be getting some sort of signal that's that's stronger than normal that's causing some sort of ringing in the ears or your head. And I was wondering if you could actually describe the nature of what you were hearing. Was it Was it in your ears? Like, could you pinpoint a physical location? Was it inside of your head, like your skull? And like, what did it sound like? That, that's that's a fascinating question, and and even as we're speaking, I still have that sound that I've had since as as long as I can remember in my head. It's right because when you focus on it, you think, well, it, it sounds like it's inside my head, in the midst of my head, but equally, it's like I can hear it outside of me. And yeah, I'm familiar with the things that you mentioned, the semantics, and there's a couple of my reports where I've gone into some depth about this and um, in relation to pineal gland and, and DMT's, you, you know, possible reaction with that gland and, and um, how and why that sound increases and how and why it produces geometry in, in your expanding consciousness. I, I, that sound is fascinating. I mean, there's obviously in the West and in medicine, there's, there's tinnitus and, you know, some people are afflicted by that. And through my work, I, I, I've come across people who, say, oh, yeah, I've got this sound in my head and, you know, it's tinnitus. And you think, okay, well, you know, it, it may be that it's a result of their previous employment. It could be uh, something related to the job they've working, where it's a genuine uh, industrial-related illness. But in the East, there are different concepts about what that sound is. You know, it's the sound of the spirit. It's this, it's that. And, you know, it does go by many terms like buzzing or a humming or the sound of many bees or the sound of running water and I can see why all those sounds would be applicable for me I I, I have to guess or I have to conjecture it, it's something to do with the I guess the interface between our esoteric our occult our, our spiritual side with our physical side what really struck me when I, I took DMT for the first time and it was just a few milligrams was how that sound so quickly reacted to the DMT in my head, that sound that had been something so mysterious and so central to me from a from childhood, and, and I'd been with me all my life, and then the DMT just amplified it significantly, and I was just, wow, you know, the, the potency of DMT, and as I say, that, that was just a few milligrams. So that sound wasn't uncomfortable then? 
You mean with them with DMT? It, just in general, like you're obviously used to it. You've had it since you were a kid. Has it ever been uncomfortable, or is it more no, of no, no, never, never. I, I, I would have to say that. I mean, it's it's now been six months since I did my last DMT experiment, and and. I, I don't know if it's age or just the fact that I've not researched for six months, but that sound is still there. It, it's always present. You know, I, I suppose the only time that I'm not really genuinely conscious of it or I can say that I'm not aware of it is if it's, it's when I'm sleeping. But when I was a child, it was I mean, it was just incredibly noticeable. As I say, you know, I, I couldn't understand it. It, it was such a. Um, prominent feature of of my life I, I thought why am i why don't my parents speak about this do they not have this sound in their head but no never never uncomfortable but, but, but always always puzzling you know what what is it you, you know so the so the dmt just just amplified it then it it made oh it... my gosh yeah i mean that that and that you know i mean you know from from the things that i've outlined the out of body experiences uh, and that, that unusual episode with seeing like a sun out outside the bedroom window. I mean, yeah, it's yeah, it just 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 amplified that sound so much. And as I said, it was just my first time with just a few milligrams, and then obviously, you know, getting to the DMT more and more, and it, it, it's the same. I mean, that sound, it's just like, yeah, I mean, it's just turning it right up. You know, it's. Uh, I mean, I felt an infatuation with it because. That sound in my head that's always been there, as I say, was such a central part of my life from as long as I can remember. And I've got a great memory of being young, very young. So to find a, a substance that impacted that directly, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I just, my curiosity was highly aroused. Do you think maybe your body, your pineal gland is endogenously creating more DMT than the average person and that's what you're hearing? Well, that's a good question, and that's something that I have covered in my reports, and I do think that, you know, some people, just for whatever reason, will have differences in, I guess, the amount of DMT, if it is within the, the pineal gland, different levels of that, different uh, different levels of activity with that. That doesn't seem unreasonable for me. You know, it doesn't seem like an unreasonable conjecture. But I've never thought of myself as anything other than average and I tell you now I mean my school days and my school reports will bear that out I was you know I was the average average but in terms of that yeah I don't know it's nobody ever mentioned it at all nobody ever spoke about it so I I, I suspect so yeah maybe because there were other unusual episodes when I was younger I can touch on those briefly if you like or we, 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 we can leave that there yeah, go ahead, for sure. Yeah, I mean, again, same age when I was having those OBEs. I, I woke up one morning and I opened my curtains and outside my bedroom window, you know, I thought I saw something looking at me. And when I looked, my God, there was this, like, man there, bearded man, but he was, he was like transparent yellow. You know, you could see him, but you could see right through him and he was there. And he was looking at me and it was like it was like a moment where you could either just say, OK, this is interesting or be frightened. And I got frightened and I ran into the bathroom and obviously in the bathroom is a frosted glass window. And I thought, my God, if he comes there, he's going to look really weird. And I, I just couldn't get into my parents' bed fast enough. And I'm saying, I've seen this and I've seen that. And, they're like, yeah, yeah, it's a bad dream, you know, you're okay, it's a dream, it wasn't, I saw that, you know. So, yeah, I mean, maybe uh, an active pineal gland or, or slightly more active than above average, yeah, may, may have attracted these things because obviously, you know, globally, experiences like OBEs and unusual accounts, especially, especially in young children, yeah, I think they're quite common, quite frequent or reasonably frequent. Yeah, I would agree too, just from what I've read and, and heard as well. I want to circle back for a minute to your interest in the occult. You know, in your book here, 
You do quote Helena Blavatsky a lot in her book, The Secret Doctrine. Would you call yourself a theosophist or is that just a text that resonates with you and you don't really feel like necessarily drawn to the cult-like behavior that some people who read that sort of thing get sucked into? Oh, do you know, I mean, I mean, that word occult, it, it does get a bad press and it's still a very much a, t- a taboo word. And I, I personally think that has to change. Um, I touched on this when I was writing. How how would I like people refer to me as a as a psychonaut? I, I don't know. I, uh, an occultist? I thought, yeah, I, I kind of like the sound of that. But, but I wouldn't say I'm really a practicing occultist. And whilst I'm not against paganism or, or witches... That's not something I've ever turned my attention to, but uh, an individual I met many years ago, a really strange and intense gentleman, he introduced me to Blavatsky's works, and uh, I mean, i I got to say, I, I just swallowed it up, and I still swallow it up, and it, it, it just, that esoteric, occult, Western esoteric philosophy, it, in drawing, you know, elements of Eastern philosophies, it chimed ever so strongly with me. I mean, as I said uh, earlier, you know, I, I felt there was something that somebody wasn't telling me and, and, and DMT kind of showed me that convincingly. But the esoteric and occult text, especially of Blavatsky, again, I felt the same. I thought, here we are. Here I have something that answers those questions that I just feel I had within me innately. There was something that somebody wasn't telling me. And I, yeah, I mean, I... I I love those philosophies, those texts that give an alternative view of our history and induce an alternative way of thinking in one as an individual. And that's not to say that easy reads, and that's not to say by any measure that I'm an expert. I'm very far from an expert. But as I say, they they chimed deeply within me and, and gave me a perspective on life that I felt answered questions that were deeper beyond words within me yeah that's what's drawn me to the occult the idea of removing the middlemen from your access to you know god or divinity or however you want to look at it it's just it's just taking those those filters off and then being able to get there on your own through your own experience through your own uh volition to wanted to talk about dmt itself before we get further into this because I've never smoked it. I've never even seen it. I'm sure there are several people that are hearing this now that probably haven't smoked it or even seen it either. So where does it come from? What's it made of? What's it look like? It looks like a white, powdery, waxy, crystalline substance. Very delicate. You know, you touch it, it's got a, not greasiness, but a waxy, vegetal texture to it. And where it comes from, I mean, I believe that there's, there's many, many sources of where it can come from. For me, it came from Mimosa hostilis root bark, which, you know, was easily sourced from the Internet. And I extracted it myself. Uh, that took me a few, few attempts and finally got there and uh, wasn't too difficult so yeah I'm, I'm 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 very pleased to say that i never sourced it from anybody else diy do it yourself yeah that's that's the best way to do it i think and th- that does remind me of i think the plant that you just mentioned reminds me of the acacia tree which some people have speculated is the burning bush in the story with moses that he might have been burning a bush that was full of dmt and just got really high on it and that's when he saw all these visions yeah, do you know, the, there are some really fascinating theories coming out now. And, and the fact that, yeah, the acacia tree seems to have such a high standing in Freemasonry, but also, you know, is is has a, a reasonably high standing in, in Islam. I, it's just astonishing, you know, and, and, and some people are putting articles out there that are hugely interesting and, dare I say, you know, probably revising history it's astonishing it's exciting and I'm, I'm glad to be a small part of that in my own way absolutely man i think if anybody picks up this book they will be i mean they'll be astonished really at the experiences that you outline here but i hope to think that they would also be intrigued and seek it out because 
if what you say, and it's, I'm not trying to make light of your experiences because they do jive with pretty much every other DMT trip I've ever heard from anybody else, but if, if what you write in your book is real and true and can be experienced by anyone, then we are missing out on quite, quite the experience, to be honest. I do want to tell people, I should have mentioned this up front, but the premise of the book is that you did a lot of research here. I think you did uh, more than 600 DMT trips. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, for, for three years, I, I just, you know, when I say I went at it, bear in mind, I got I got a full-time job. I got a family and I, I need to make sure that my boys are doing their homework and that you're growing up into good kids, you know, good young adults. But yeah, for three years, I, I stayed off the DMT internet forums that I'd been frequenting and for three years, I just, just, I don't want to say went at it, but I, I set my stall out and said, okay, well, I'm going to have an intention. And my intention is to understand the causal nature of these bizarre experiences after inhaling the vapor. That was my intention. And yeah, over three years and 600 experiments, which will be three books. I mean, there's not 600 experiments in the first book, so it was like, one one book a year shall we say and the first book is my first year second book second year etc and yeah and, and that's not to say that all three on sorry 600 experiments were were breakthroughs it's not that i've tried to go further or deeper than anybody else i'm approaching this from an investigative capacity so when i first started having the experiences for sure it, it, it looked like i was going to another world and another realm the so-called hyperspace, and it, it was utterly, utterly convincing. But I thought that that just can't be. You can't be going somewhere else when you're laid on your bedroom floor. So I thought, okay, well, how do I get halfway there? So, yeah, there are experiments where I've taken low doses, and there are experiments where I've taken high doses. So, yeah, it wasn't about... Let me hammer this, you know. Let 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 me get drunk on DMT. It was not about that. And you mentioned that that word earlier, Ryan. True. And the one thing I'm proudest of, above all else, with all three books, should should all three get published, is I was absolutely 100% honest throughout. I I took no literary license whatsoever in any any particular. I was just absolutely honest. And you know. You didn't need to make the stuff up. It was bizarre enough without having to cover any literary license. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, the bizarreness of it all jives with all the other stories I've heard from people who have done it. I think you quoted Diana Slattery or mentioned her name in your book or somewhere. Uh, oh, no, it was in a... You wrote a recent article on academia.edu. You linked off to a Diana Slattery something or other. and the, yes. She's famous for calling DMT the what-the-fuck drug. And that's essentially, <laughs> it's essentially what, what we're talking about here is. It, the experiences are so bizarre, it's like what-the-fuck. So, And I, I do want to talk about the nature of the DMT trip because some people are probably more familiar with magic mushrooms and experimenting with psilocybin. And you do mention in your book that there is a sort of similarity between the mushroom trip and the DMT trip, right? I think, I think ultimately they, I think they're the same thing. Ultimately, I know psilocybin is not DMT, but I think when it, when it gets into the system, I think it's pretty much doing the same thing, but the effects seem to be markedly different. So with, with with psilocybin, I, I don't know, I, I find it, obviously it's longevity is a, a factor. I find with DMT, it's more clear cut. My, my mind remains clear and cogent, whereas with magic mushrooms, oh my gosh, you know, it's, it's, it's bendy. It's, it's classic, classically trippy, psychedelic. And DMT, I, I didn't quite find it like that. I found that very, very different. And like McKenna said, the only thing you've got to fear with DMT is death through astonishment. And and that's the thing, you know, <laughs> yeah. it, it, when you begin with it, the the things you see are just uh, astonishing. Yeah, so that connection between mushroom trips and DMT trips is not really something that I've heard much about. But like I said, you have some rather thought-provoking insights into the possibilities that they are similar, especially in terms of the entities that may be present during a psilocybin trip. We know they're present during DMT trips, but I've not really talked to a lot of people that have experimented with mushrooms that 
claim to have seen any sort of spiritual entity. So I'm wondering then if you've had that same sort of experience with mushrooms that you did on DMT in terms of encountering entities in that space. Not as much, but for sure, I would say that anybody experimenting with, with psilocybin mushrooms, whether they're aware of it or not, that they're attracting something which they may not see, but that's something that for whatever reason has an interest in, I don't know, amplified human consciousness while on a psychoactive substance. And, and yeah, I mean, looking back to my uh, a particularly heavy dose of magic mushrooms, which was my first ever experience with magic mushrooms, looking back I, now I've been had my DMT experiences, I can see what was happening. There was something there with me. And indeed, I mean, I'm attesting that the the source of the astonishing hallucinations is in fact or are in fact mental constructs being imposed upon our perception by oh, spiritual beings. That's what I like to call them for the time being. But I'm, I'm conscious that other people prefer, I don't know, hyperspatial entities, intelligent energies, um, aliens. Although I, I, I disfavor that term myself, I, I struggle using that term for these DMT entities. Yeah, I, I don't like the term aliens. I mean, really what we're talking about is just something that's foreign or unknown to us when we're using that term. So I'm right there with you on that one, which that yeah. sort of leads us into a good segue, you know, to talk about the the real nature of the DMT experience itself. And I have a quote here that I want to read from your book. You wrote that, My research findings have shown me that the DMT experience is not one whereby my consciousness emerges into an otherwise unseen hidden reality, but rather the experience is one wherein unseen beings from an otherwise unseen reality actually emerge into the terrestrial dimension. And that's the end of the quote. And I think that's an important distinction to make because most people familiar with the DMT experience or the research behind it would probably think the exact opposite of that. Well, yeah, and you know what? I, I don't rule anything out. All I can say is after three years of research with X amount of experiments, this is my interpretation. This is my finding, and I, and I stand by that. And I don't rule out that maybe some users genuinely are, you know, some aspect of them is really going into an alternative realm. I didn't find that, and I found that the higher I went with DMT, I was just getting close to unconsciousness. You know, and and I wouldn't have been able to bring anything back from that. And when I read people now, you know, posting trip reports, especially new people, or people that are new to DMT, you know, that, that they are convinced they've gone somewhere else, they've gone to another realm. And I've said, and it, it, it's an absolutely convincing illusion, because when you are engulfed within the mind of a a spiritual being that's powerfully imposing and mesmerically imposing upon you and making that reality look far more real than ordinary everyday reality looks for sure you think my god where the hell am i look at this place and it seems to be able to engineer that space in in ways that make it, it can make it look larger and having more depth than your immediate surroundings so you know you you can be in a a relatively small room engulfed within the mind of a spiritual being that's imposing upon you and and mesmerizing you and you can look like yeah you're in another world and the horizon is is far off to the yonder but really i didn't find that i i i I stand by the claim the quote that you just read that that's certainly my experiences after three years and i i absolutely stand by that so your contention is that you your consciousness is not traveling anywhere else, but other things are traveling here. Is that right? Partly, yeah. I mean, it's unfair to say that your consciousness is not traveling anywhere. What, what I found is that the DMT is a very powerful amplifier of human consciousness. Um, and we, we talked about its effect on that sound before and um, what i found is that you know it's almost like you, you smoke the dmt and then if you imagine like a a big so a sober ball just expanding quickly rapidly out from your mind i guess that's 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 a reasonable visual analogy and um, when one does that one's 
then changed one's setting. You know, people talk about sets and setting. They're eminently valid considerations. But well, once you smoke DMT, you have changed your setting because you have amplified your consciousness. I mean, significantly. And that seems to be the uh, that seems to result in, in, in something that's otherwise unseen very rapidly and extremely energetically imposing upon you and you, your your perceptions. Yeah, I, I, it seems to me that you are one is being to a degree or varying degrees mesmerized. And I choose my you know I, I, after three years of research and, and my interesting in esoteric and occult literature. I try and choose all my words very carefully, and yeah, it do, does seem to be a, a partially mes- mesmeric state. So, do you think that consciousness can or cannot operate independently outside of the human body and brain? Yeah, I, of course, I think it can, because as I say, I mean, as a young child with those out-of-body experiences from a young age, that, that convinced me that there is something within me and something within every human being that can indeed exist independent of the human body yeah I, but with I'm, with, oh, with EMT I didn't find it it didn't it never induced what I would say is a classic out of body experience but I mean once I took my research outside and I was smoking DMT in the garden and laying back I mean for sure I have seen my mind stuff my consciousness I mean look if I say filling the sky, people are going to be like, what the hell? Honestly, I mean, that stuff is really, really powerful. And you can smoke that and you can lay back. And, and you know, it's not every occasion where something's going to come and impose upon you and interact with you. You might just be amplifying your consciousness to an extent that, you know, you know, you, you can see this stuff. You can see this mind stuff out there. And the wind can be blowing, and that mind stuff ain't moving anywhere because it's it, it's it's different stuff. It's it's different to the terrestrial stuff that we're used to. Yeah, it, it definitely seems to be that way for sure. I'm wondering then, how would you compare the DMT experience to the experience of having a dream or a lucid dream? Are they similar? That that is that is such a good question. Definitely similar, and it is made me wonder you know okay are there occasions when my dreams are possibly influenced by an interaction with 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 something that's otherwise unseen and and i i'm moving towards that. in fact i'm there i've taken that view and i've i think for the last couple of years i've i've kept a log of dreams where i felt well do you know what that that was just so intense and so highly defined and so outside my usual dreams I'm convinced that something was in, interacting with me. And I, I kept a, a log of that for the last couple of years. I think I've noted down about 20 or 30 occasions where I thought that that was just, there had to be something else, you know. I, I mean, the, the questions that arise from this with these DMT entities, these spirits, the, 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 the real perplexing, fascinating question is, what is their natural relationship to us? And then very quickly, if you're looking for answers to that, you're back into the esoteric and the occult philosophy. And, yeah, I mean, there are answers in there. You know, you, you can find answers to those questions. It quickly becomes discomforting, though, for people who take a logical or rational view of, of life and don't subscribe to any belief in any spirits or spiritual realm. You know, it, it quickly becomes discomforting, and I quickly would be marked up as a a lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> well, how would you answer that question then? What is the nature of these spiritual beings that you've encountered? Oh, well, the nature of the ones that I've encountered. I mean, I mean, these these um, I gave them the term occult master because I was just so impressed with their power, their intellect, their wisdom, their compassion. I mean, these are exceedingly powerful beings so in terms of on dmt yeah the, the ones i encountered were incredibly incredibly impressive i do believe although i have no direct evidence of it i do believe that there are a whole range of uh, uh, an entire kingdom of of varying beings spiritual beings of, of varying evolutionary degrees 
And I think, you know, the, the occult and esoteric liter literature will say, you know, that there are many that are lower than man. There'll be some that are on the same level as man, and there'll be many that are higher than man, and many that we'll, we'll never get to find out about because they're so far beyond, you know, our evolutionary status at, at, at this level. But yeah, I, I believe that, you know, the esoteric and occult literature imbued in me an ardent belief, I guess it would have to be a faith, that there were unseen beings all around us. And I held that view be before I'd even heard of DMT. And it was, you know, DMT just, just gave me that evidence. It convinced me, you know, through e experiential accounts. Well, this may be the most important question I ask you, but... How the hell do you go back to a regular life after all these experiences? How the hell do you go back to a day job and just not like fantasize about being, you know, it's like frolicking <laughs> through your own consciousness with these spiritual beings? Like, how do you do that, man? I don't know. I think, as I say, because I'd held that view for so long that, you know, I mean, and the esoteric and occult view, it's not a mainstream view. So I held that view that unseen all around us and and far out into the universe, there are kingdoms, hierarchies of, of beings and intelligences, some far beyond anything we can imagine. So the DNT kind of just, just confirmed that. But, yeah, I mean, you know, what, <laughs> you know, in terms of work, you know, I kept, kept it under my hat. I mean, the, there's one colleague who's a colleague friend, and I, I confided in him, and, you know, he, he's, he's a Muslim, so I don't know if in, in Islam, you know, they have the concept of, of jinn, they believe in jinn. And initially, you know, he was sceptical, but the more I explained it to him, yeah, he came on board and, you know, he, he'll never try DMT himself, but yeah, he came on board. So I don't know, as I say, family man, two boys, yeah, it's, 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 it's not as difficult, it's not too difficult, uh, you know. He certainly changed me as an individual, but... Yeah, it's it's not too difficult to go to work and just get my mind on the job. And, you know, as soon as I clock off, then my mind's on to other things. It's interesting that your Muslim friend would be skeptical, like you said, if, if he's a, a true follower of Islam, then the jinn, which are, you know, supernatural beings, why would he be so skeptical of your claim that, well, yeah, I was interacting with these supernatural beings. Like, why would he be so skeptical of that? Do you know what? It, it seems to be, even among people who have a religious belief that I've spoke to about my experiences, they can be religious and believe in God and angels, etc. But when I explain what I've done and what I've seen, they don't want to buy it. They don't want to accept it. And that, to me, is absolutely fascinating. And I can say, Ryan, that my wife, too, is, is Muslim, hence my surname. And it is a pen name, but my surname, Khan. You know she's muslim she believes in jinn and as i've said you know i'm infinitely lucky to have such a patient and understanding wife but i would explain my experiences to her and and what my opinion was and she just no 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 to begin with just would not have it and you know again muslim she believes in jinn but but now you know yeah i, I guess guess she's on board with 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 what i've experienced and what i've explained Hmm. Yeah, that is an interesting uh, case study, just just like a little nugget there, you know. It's, it seems like everybody wants to believe in these things until they actually find somebody who's who's interacting with yeah. them. They're like, no way, yeah. no, that that's not possible. <laughs> yeah, it's fa absolutely fascinating, a, a resistance to the spiritual. I mean, you know, I, I, I once, my mum, I, I explained it to my mum once, a couple of years ago at Christmas, and oh man, no, nah, no, nah, I don't talk about it. She just would not have it, you know, and, and my mum's, uh, you know, a Christian, believes in God and the angels, etc. But yeah, when I run that past her, that did not go down well at all. It's like, I don't know what you think you're seeing, but da 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 and I, Okay, all right, fine. <laughs> yeah, it, it seems like the church, the religions of the world, want you to follow them, but they don't really want you to have a true religious experience, if that makes sense. That makes perfect sense and well said. I, I think that, that that's a powerful statement, and it's absolutely true. And, but obviously, clearly with... Um, DMT, entheogens, psychonautical experiences, clearly it, it is changing. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, I I interviewed somebody uh, several months ago about. He wrote this book called The Psychedelic Gospels, where he traveled throughout some of the old churches and cathedrals in Europe and found evidence of of magic mushrooms and all of these like frescoes and this these these artworks. And and then I you know we talked about the the burning bush theory several minutes ago you know it does seem like if these sorts of substances can give you access to that sort of divinity and that sort of spiritual or religious experience that who's to say that you know people wandering through the desert back in biblical times weren't just picking up leaves from the acacia tree and just getting high on them and then hey there's god right there right there interacting with you <laughs> I, I i think i think that this this research that's coming out and I, i'm when I say I'm familiar with the the author of the book that you, you're referring to, I, I've not read it, but it's certainly on my reading list, and I've got a great quote which I'll I'll, I'll explain. I'll, I'll give it a minute from there, but yeah, I think this research that's coming out that's pointing towards these substances not only being known and understood by people in antiquity, but used and, and dare I say, probably an entire science behind them at certain levels of those civilizations. Yeah, I, th- I think that that that's the way that academia is pointing towards it i think it's not only fascinating but i think it's absolutely valid and i want to say unsurprising really and the quote from the book i think it's like psychedelic gospels by is it henry bergson uh no the guy that i interviewed uh, was named jerry brown ah maybe this is a quote within the book but yeah it, it says the uh, the eyes only see what the mind is prepared to comprehend and i came across that yesterday on twitter wrote it down and uh, it's associated with that book and i thought that was a really great little quote great little statements yeah and that's actually you know you're in my head right now because i wanted to ask you about the pineal gland specifically so you know talking about eyes really uh, is a good transition into that but you wrote that well and it's not like this is common knowledge but i'm just going to quote you you know you wrote in your book that the pineal gland was once a, a working organ of sight that allowed access to these natural or spiritual realms that are now mostly unseen. And we know that this gland does have similarities to our lateral eyes, you know, the ones that, are, uh, that we can actually see on other people. The gland does have an eyelid on it. It has light receptors. But to me, it, it almost seems relatively useless to us these days. And I, I think that's very sad because it's, it's part of our physiology. So why do you think that this gland is not as active as it once was? Why can we not access and use it like we perhaps once could? Okay, I, again, I think the the esoteric and occult philosophists can shed some light on that. I, I don't know if there's a pun intended in there. But, yeah, I mean, the secret doctrine will, will attest that, you know, the, the pineal gland was once mankind's spiritual eye and when you think of mankind being spiritual, it's not as we are now. And this is going back aeons and aeons into the past when we we were mentally, spiritually, physiologically so, so very different to what we are now, according to those philosophies. And then over aeons and aeons, as as the spirit becomes slowly enmeshed in matter, you know, the spiritual diminishes it doesn't quite extinguish, but as we become enmeshed in matter as, as to where we are now, you know, absolutely deep within the mires of matter, then that pineal gland is is still slightly active. And I think the evidence of that is is, is dreams and intuitions, but it's certainly not the organ it once was. But it's there and it's there for a reason. And according again to esoteric and occult philosophies, there'll be an upturn, you know, as mankind's gone down in, into the, the, the depths of matter, there'll be an upturn, and over aeons and aeons and aeons, we'll leave those bonds of matter, and we'll return to the spiritual, and I guess as we slowly do that, then potentially, possibly, that, that pineal gland will once again reawaken, is reawakening, and will play a part in in mankind's change over millions and millions of years into something that is subtly and slowly very very different to what we are now yeah absolutely man i went through a phase where i I got really conspiratorial about the pineal gland and how it we were sort of poisoned with these chemicals you know fluoride etc that really shut down that function you know once we got into this quote-unquote civilized society i don't know if you've heard anything like that but it, it 
does seem that that we are consuming things that would have an adverse effect on its function. Well, I'm in the UK, so our water treatment is with chlorine, which obviously is an aggressive and terrible chemical. But I think once the product, the water comes out of the tap, the potable water, you know, I don't think there's any chlorine there. But for sure, I think in the States, then their, their cleansing agent is fluoride. And i got to say, I'm, I'm really glad that we are not using that over here in the UK. And I... I know the kind of conspiratorial point that you're making and I, I do I think it's absolutely scandalous that you know this organ is so magical and yet it's so sensitive to to certain substances certain chemicals and my god you know there's there's, there's one of the greatest nations on earth cleaning its water with this stuff I mean if I was in the states I, I, I think I'd be on bottled water rather than tap water that said you know I should probably look at the science before making such a, a quote. But yeah, from 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 what I do know and from what I have read, then yeah, I think the concern is genuine. Well, I don't understand why you need to clean water. I mean, I, I get mine from a natural spring about 15 minutes from my house, so I don't have to do anything to it. I just pull it from the spring, drink it. Uh, oh, it just tastes so much better. But this that podcast... That sounds so <laughs> idyllic. That sounds yeah. great. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, but, but this, I don't want this to turn into a, a podcast about water. Uh, I know we're short on time here. I just have two more questions for you, and I think they're ones that you could answer fairly quickly. So I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you. I know we're talking about your first book here, but of all the 600 experiments that you've had, there's probably 120 or 30 that are cataloged in this first book here, but which of these experiences was the most profound to you or maybe like one or two that you had that were your favorite ones when you look back on them like oh I wish I could relive that specific one there were lots and lots that were just just playful beyond imagination I mean I would love to relive those they were just so intense so playful but I'd say the ones that stick out are when when the entities started to operate invasively you know they would impose their power within your setting and 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 they would actually be physically is probably the wrong word but they would be operational and active within your physiology and able to i don't know just just manipulate your psyche your voice i mean that was just wow that was just incredible so yeah those but I, I would say when I went outside and when I'd gone outside, the, 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 there seemed to have been a change in that I was no longer seeing the mental constructs, the hallucinations imposing upon me. When I'd gone outside, I was actually seeing the beings or those kind of beings that can impose those experiences. And I've got to be honest, hands down, they were by far the most incredible sights, I would have to say, of my entire life. Because there you really know you've seen something natural. It's symmetry, it's geometry, it's just it's a, it's a, just beyond beautiful. And you can feel its energy, and you can feel its power, and you just know you just know if if a hard no scientist was laid here with me now and could see what I'm seeing, my God, they would change their mind about these things. On, on just on an instant they were just unbelievable sights that's my main qualm with science is that it tries to rationalize everything and what we're talking about here by its very nature is irrational so you really can't <laughs> rationalize it to a degree i i understand why you say that but to a degree but what my approach ryan has been to try and bring some rationality to it i don't see why this can't be considered as the beginnings of a new science and it's a science of the immeasurable and the science that we have today it's it's concerned with measuring and cataloging and weighing and quantifying so this is a different kind of science this is a a science of the immeasurable and and I, i guess the only way to really go into it is is with a a knowledge or an appreciation of esoteric and occult literature i think it certainly helps in in coming to an understanding as to what what you're dealing with and i think it would be a real shame if the adherents the 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 the, the psychonauts that are undertaking this research started saying oh it's this and it's this without reference to these esoteric and occult philosophers which have attested to these realities since time immemorial 
Yeah, I, I'm glad you sort of corrected me there because I have been reading a lot about rationality and irrationality recently. I've been talking about it a lot, so I like the way that you phrased that there. I got one more question for you, Dick, and I asked certain guests this question that I think can give me a a unique and profound answer. So based on your experiences here, I'm wondering, what is love to you, and what does love have to do with everything that you've experienced here? Oh, I I would say love is a it's a univer a universal agent, and it, it it's probably something of of such depth and and you know something that's infinite and something of such profundity that I I as a human being I I could never hope to understand it in its fullness. Very very far from that. Um, sorry, what was the second part of the question, Ryan? What love has to do with your experiences? Did you experience something during your DMT trips that you would describe as love, perhaps? Wow, that is a great question. I, I would say, I, I mean, there were there were times when I, I, yeah, yeah, there were times when look, I, I burst into tears and I, I, I cried and I wept like a child, not because I was upset, because it, it was. I'd been given an experience, something had imposed upon me in such a profound manner. I mean, life-changing manner that, yeah, you 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 feel maybe beyond love. You almost feel like in that moment that that thing that's done that to you deserves worship. You know, I mean, yeah, real, real, a real profound attachment in that moment, a real profound love for that thing because it's clearly those beings that are in charge of these interactions and that's what they are interactions and it's clearly them that can determine and do determine which way it goes and as i say there have been times when i've i've cried and wept and yeah felt felt love for for those beings that I, i came to term occult masters whether they're the divas of antiquity or whatever they are or may yet come to be called I, I you know i have to say i don't really know but what i do know is wow from my interactions with them wow that really is something worth writing about i would agree man I'm, and i'm glad that you wrote this book and i'm glad that you have two more in the works so dick Khan, tell people where they can find you and your work if they want more of it yeah, sure. I'm 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 on Facebook as DMT dot researcher. I'm on Twitter as DMT underscore researcher. And books available on CreateSpace or it's available through Amazon uh, UK uh, dot com. And I'm hoping to make a Kindle version available um, towards the end of this year. Hey man, I really do appreciate your time. I would love to talk to you again sometime more about this. And I have such great admiration for what you've done here. And I I really do think it's important work that needs to get out there and people need to to read it. And I know there's a lot of DMT research that's been done. You know, obviously Rick Strassman's work is kind of pioneering in, in that field. But I think that the more you called yourself average earlier. I don't think somebody who's done 600 DMT experiments in three years is average, but the more average normal human beings that can be exposed to these ideas and this research and who have even sort of an inclination on whatever level that there's just more to this than what we are experiencing right now. I think your work is is important to those kind of people. So I commend you for going down that path. I commend your bravery for wanting to do that, you know, so often for so long. It it really is. I I think most people would be terrified to to undertake some sort of experiment like that just one time oh, there, was, there was a lot of a lot of fear and a lot of terror i i can tell you yeah there was a lot of that <laughs> absolutely man well i'm not going to keep you any longer thanks for your time again dick it was great chatting with you oh ryan i've got to say thank you very much i, I was so nervous before you know, this interview but honestly i i gotta say i've enjoyed it and you know i i guess i i love your tone and your money you know you've made it really easy and enjoyable and and that's a plus honestly i've enjoyed it so much thank you so much man no problem man no problem anytime you have my twitter you have my instagram you have uh, i don't know if we're on facebook friends or if i follow you on there yet but you also have my email feel free to reach out and let me know what's going on with you anytime 
much appreciated listen uh, uh, congratulations best wishes and good luck with the, with this this project you're dealing with i think it's remarkable it's fantastic thank you Holy smokes. My thanks again to Dick Kahn for taking the time to talk a bit about his research. Check out the links to his work in the show notes if you're interested. But man, I really wish I had more time with him. But as you heard him say, he was a bit nervous and we only committed to an hour. So it was a bit challenging to cover as much as I wanted to in such a short amount of time. Regardless, I thought we did a nice job of touching on the major components of his work and experiences. There's just so much here to explore, which is the nature of our occult mind, I suppose. But how about that? Doing DMT 600 times in 3 years? Can you even imagine the type of shit you'd see tripping on DMT that many times? Good lord. But anyway, this episode is also the first in a loose trilogy of episodes that examine the nature of the mind and the subconscious. And it was not planned out this way, it just sort of happened, so I'm running with it. I typically try to avoid back-to-back shows that are similar in theme. For example, I spread out a few mind control episodes as much as I could over the last couple of months. But I like the way these three sort of build off each other. And actually, you may throw the last episode in there too, where I was talking with D8 underscore THC about similar nature of reality type things. A nice little quadrivium of consciousness, if you will. And then not to look too far ahead, but October and November are shaping up quite nicely, if I may say so. So do yourself a favor, do me a favor too, and hit that subscribe button and join our growing family here at Old Culture. It's the least you can do. Of course, if you want to do a little more, you can also leave the show a nice review on iTunes if you're using an Apple product. And if you're feeling really generous, hit up oldculturepodcast.com slash support. There are donation options via PayPal and Bitcoin. Help me get out of this shitty 9 to 5 world so I can take this podcast to another level of this occult reality. But honestly, either way, I appreciate your support however you show it. Whether it's a download, a subscription, a review, a donation, it all matters and it all means quite a lot to me. And with that, it's time for me to bounce up out of here. You've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.